Uh, the very first thing you need to know is it is the one session in all of the Ideas Festival where you will be encouraged to go to sleep. You are given utter permission to sleep during this panel, and Christy Ashwanden will be telling you why. So um, with that authorization, uh, we'll begin by introducing Christy Ashwanden, a uh, longtime journalist and um, great favorite of mine for her extremely sensible reporting that I bookmark, I put in Evernote, I can index. I've got lots of Christie pieces in my Evernote. Uh, her latest book is called Good to Go, The Athlete in All of Us Can Learn from the Strange Science of Sports Recovery, which is for sale right here in the registration tent on the other side. Uh, and she also has a regular podcast, Emerging Forms, which you can all download. Um, then, Eric Topol, who said, just introduced me as being of the Scripps Research Institute. And once you see how many followers he has on Twitter, you will understand why he needs no further introduction. But he's an authority on artificial intelligence and medicine of all kinds, but we'll be talking about uh, personalized nutrition and what you can learn from your own uh, genome and microbiome. So I'd like to start with some of the excellent advice and findings I heard Christy give at a lunchtime session that a few of us were fortunate enough to listen to uh, this very day across the way. Um, so some of the, I'll cue you if you can't remember what was particularly counterintuitive, <laughs> but could you start with some of the findings from the book? All right, so the book is about exercise recovery, all the things that athletes need to do to be good to go from one uh, bout of exercise or one event to the other. And I will just uh, do a, a big spoiler, which is the number one thing that athletes can do for recovery is sleep. Sleep is number one. It's probably number two, three, four, five. Nothing else comes close. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is that sleep is also really important for recovery from all sorts of tasks not just from sports, but from any kind of performance. And so I think it's really important. I was just telling Corby earlier that you know, the New York Times did this really interesting interview with a bunch of uh, Democratic presidential candidates. And one of the questions they asked everyone is how much sleep they got. And I was just going, oh my god, I can't believe this. So many of them were saying they got four or five hours of sleep, which is just terrible, terrible for cognitive performance or anyone who wants to be at their best. That's just you know, it, it shows a lack of priorities. You really need to prioritize sleep if you're going to be performing in any kind of uh, event. Uh, let alone a um, large campaign rally. Right, right. And so naps are good too. I saw a couple people napping outside here in between sessions. That's great. I give my And if it weren't up. for the fact you would wake them up, you would have applauded. That's right. I did take a couple photos. <laughs> um, and what about general nutritional advice? Yeah, so this is really interesting. There are so many products now out there, nutritional products, marketed for recovery. And what I found in looking at the research is that most of this is hype. So what's really important for recovery is good nutrition, um, but it's really the, the good nutrients that you need. It's not one particular food or another. There used to be this notion that you needed to eat something immediately following exercise. The idea was there was something called the, the window of recovery. So the concept was they thought that um, after you exercise, you deplete the glycogen in your muscles, which is what the fuel that muscles use. And the idea was that immediately following that bout of exercise, you really needed to refuel then or it would not be as replenished as well. And that the, this timing was really important. But what ended up happening is as they did more studies and researched this issue more, it became apparent that it was the nutrition itself and the actual nutrients, the protein and the carbohydrates, that were important. It was not the timing itself. Didn't you mean to say protein only, never, never carbohydrates? Right, right. Well, this is a whole point of contention. Right, And I think you know, Eric and I were talking right before the session about how so much of what is said in the public and people's feelings about nutrition are really sort of bordering on religion rather than science. And um, I wrote a whole story. I did a project for 538 when I was the lead science writer there uh, looking at nutritional studies. And the headline was something like, you can't trust what you read about nutrition. And oh, it was, issue... it was more sweeping than that. <laughs> 
But the issue was that uh, nutritional studies are extremely difficult to do, and the reason is it's very hard to figure out what people are actually eating, even if you try your best. Um, let me just give you an example. If I were to ask you, how many times did you eat tomatoes in the last year? On a daily basis, what serving size tomato <laughs> did you eat? It's very difficult to even answer that question, right? But if you're a researcher trying to look at, say, the health benefits or health detriments of a particular food, whether it's tomatoes or berries or whatever it might be, it's extremely difficult to quantify. And even if you wanted to take people, you know, take a large group of people and split them into two, what they've found again and again in these sorts of studies where they try to randomize and control it is that what ends up happening is it's very difficult to get people to adhere here to these diets that are done in the study. And I think anyone who's tried to lose weight knows that it's hard to adhere to a diet, right, unless it's the thing that you're choosing. And so it often ends up happening, and this happened with some of the studies on, say, low-fat and high-fat diets, where what ended up happening is the two groups were actually much more similar than they were intended to be because you had adherence problems. And so it's just an extremely difficult uh, problem to study. And so the, the issue here is not that uh, nutrition researchers are horrible people and they're not doing a good job and not trying their best. But the issue is that it's an extremely difficult issue to study. And if it wasn't, we would have solved it all by now, right? Right. In fact, there's a, there's a time study about uh, two groups that we're going to bring up later, but, but that'll be after Eric has um, uh, some stuff to say. Um, you also had different news. Oh, I, I wanted to ask actually the, the, the group. How many of you have filled out a food survey or questionnaire for your nutritionist as part of a checkup? A very few of you. But I think that you might all agree that it's really hard to think of what you actually ate with any kind of accuracy. You immediately forget and you do what everyone does on food surveys, which is lie. You <laughs> say what you think was probably more helpful, but you don't actually want to admit. And we're going to be hearing about a piece of software that Eric was telling us about that might um, be able to call, catch you out on your lies. But before we move to Eric, there's one more piece of what I thought was very counterintuitive advice when someone asked, uh, but what about stretching? Oh, Speaking stretching. of that window of recovery and what we really need to keep in mind, because so many of us think of stretching as a kind of religion. Right. Well, it is something that it's very ritualized. It feels good. We've all been taught that you need to stretch to prevent injuries. But it's interesting when you look at the research, and there's been quite a bit of research on stretching. It turns out that stretching doesn't reduce the risk of injury um, from sports and exercise. And in fact, stretching uh, before an athletic event may actually <coughs> reduce your performance a little bit. This is uh, based on some researchers and runners. And so, you know, so many people are stretching in hopes that they will be either less sore or they will reduce their chance of injury, and it turns out that that doesn't hold up. Um, what it does do, though, stretching will help your flexibility. So if you are stretching in order to be able to touch your toes better, by all means, continue to do so. But um, if you're doing it in hopes of you know, preventing injury or preventing soreness, uh, you, you can save your time. But yours, you know, I think everybody here is open-mouthed as I was because this is such a religion. But you had at least a justification for when you were, you've been kind of an extremely trained athlete all your life. Yeah. And when you were captain of a team in high school? Yeah, in high school, I was the captain of the track team, and we would have, before practice, every day, we would have a very ritualized stretching routine, and it was like, there was something like 10 stretches, and we would do them in order, and we would sort of finish up with these buddy stretches, and I think that that stretching served a very important purpose, which was, it was all of us sort of bonding as a team, it was a ritual for us to come together and get prepared for the run or, or the day's events. And so I think that sometimes some of the things that we do um, may be very beneficial in some way, but the explanation that we're given or the sort of science or scientific explanation that we're told doesn't hold up, but that doesn't mean that it's not serving some purpose that is beneficial. For example, and we're about to come to Eric, the data that you eat less if you are conversing at a meal, you digest better, absorption is better because the social interaction slows you down and allows the feelings of satiety that you're full to reach your brain uh, much more intuitively and better than if you are um, 
checking your um, microphone <laughs> at a sweet green in the afternoon next to your um, cell phone. Um, Eric, so you recently wrote um, a very provocative piece in March in the New York Times about thinking of tailoring your own diet and your reaction to sugar, to glucose, which is so important when anyone thinks of controlling their weight, their energy balance, all of it, by analyzing your microbiome. So can you lead us through what that analysis yeah. entailed and some of the things you kind of did not think you were going to find out? Right, well, I, I just first want to get back to uh, Christie's about the um, the poor nutritional science, that was the history, but I think it really got turned around and what this was, a work from Israel, the Wiseman Institute. And instead of the food diaries that you talked about, they actually had prepared meals. And they've now studied thousands of people and they gave the exact same food, the exact same amount, the exact same time, and they studied everything about these people, including a glucose sensor, uh, including all their labs, uh, their, their sleep, their activity, their stress, and their gut microbiome. And at the end of all that, what they came up with is they could recommend foods that would avoid glucose spikes on an individualized basis. Now, that cracked the whole case because up until now, everybody's assuming there's this one diet that's somehow magical for all people, which couldn't be further from the truth. And it's finally, we can acknowledge that we have this unique response to food. And it isn't just a gut microbiome, but that's a big part of the story. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the group from uh, London, King's College, they have a project, Sapiens, where they have the largest twin study uh, in the world. And they brought in 1,000 twins from all over the UK. And they not only replicated that work, but they also put in a line in their blood, uh, bloodstream to detect triglyceride response to food. You know, I'm going to just be a little pedant and say, I read 6,000, but it didn't say pairs of twins or people, but yeah. it was a lot of twins. Yeah, 1,001 right. twins. And so um, anyway, they, they had the triglycerides and the insulin levels, and they too, for the exact same food, showed this marked divergence. So I was very intrigued by these experiments, so I signed up. Uh, with the Israelis, and I did this for two weeks. And this was before there's now an app called BiteSnap where you can take a picture of your food and it tells you what it is. I had to write down everything I ate and drank for two weeks. I had a glucose sensor, I had a gut microbiome sample, um, and then I got an output for me about what foods would be the best food to avoid glucose spikes. Now, before I go too far in this, it doesn't mean that glucose spikes are going to lead to diabetes or heart disease. We don't know that. So this is not ready for people to go sign up. This is really still in the research phase. There's so many reasons it's not ready, as you will well, be telling us. It's, it's yeah. really interesting. Um, so there, there's a great podcast out there that you should all go listen to. It's called Emerging Forms. Well, Emerg Emerging Form is my podcast, and you should certainly listen to that. But Gastropod is a, a, a podcast about the science of food, and they did actually a special episode on this recently. They also wrote a companion piece at the New York Times about this very study that Eric is talking about. And what's really interesting is so the two hosts of the podcast took part in the study as well, and they got some of their personal results back. But what was really interesting is that they both um, experienced a sense of anxiety based on some of the, the results. And I think that this is a really important thing to think about and a consequence that needs to be taken in, into consideration. Right, right. No, absolutely. But I think what, what we're getting at is that we're, so the twins, just to be uh, getting back to that, they had markedly identical twins, markedly divergent response to glucose, replicating the Israeli study, and triglycerides, and insulin. And then when I did this, I had these glucose spikes. I'm not a diabetic, up to 180, 190. I said, whoa. And I learned uh, that there were these foods that I like, my favorite food. Oh, no. We're doing this. Favorites. And, the, it wasn't and, the, and the foods that they recommended that I eat like cheesecake and bread. They recommended cheesecake. Yeah. And what to else? avoid the glucose spikes. They, and I wouldn't go near that stuff. I'm a cardiologist. I mean, I, <laughs> I would die. So, you know, that, and then. And what was causing the spikes? But wait, what, I want to know, how are they deciding that cheesecake, like what is the evidence that cheesecake is going to be better than, say, ice cream or I yeah. the level of soda pop? Well, they have, they have basically every food in their resource now from machine learning. It, that's a, another part of the story. If we didn't have uh, AI, machine learning, we would never have cracked this case because there's so much data. This was billions of, of, of data points. So 
uh, they then can take the foods from the thousands of people that have been studied and impute the other foods. And then, of course, I replicated their work. I mean, I went ahead with the glucose sensor, and I tried the foods. I didn't eat any bratwurst, but, uh, but I, I so then. Bratwurst is something that they said was really important for a you. Plus a plus rating. A plus. A plus. plus. Yeah. But only for you. But for me, for it's you. all individualized. And yeah. Eric, tell us what were some of the things that you really didn't expect to be causing these spikes, according to this. Yeah, well, you know, I, I just uh, was so surprised. I thought, you know, things like oatmeal, for me, might be very different for anyone else here. You know, that was a, 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 a glucose spike problem for me. So I, I learned a lot from this. Now, is it going to change my uh, whole you know, uh, nutritional plan? No, but I think what it indicates is we're chipping away at this. This is not like the nutritional science that I totally agree with is pretty shoddy and questionable. This is a new form of multimodal data that's authentic and is, it, we're learning a lot about it. And, it. and the gut microbiome, and we're learning every day. I mean, today we learned that the gut microbiome from elite athletes has a bacterium that is associated with a remarkable endurance. And when that same bacterium was put into mice, they ran on the treadmill forever, you know. Because I and thought it was they, a reduction of lactate. Mechanism. Weren't you saying a reduction of lactate? Yeah, so the lactate metabolism was markedly altered, as it was shown. And then they went back to a whole bunch more elite athletes, and they had this sp specific bacterium, this Vianella atypica, atypia. And so now you can just envision they're going to start selling crapsules of vanilla atypia. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, no, but the gut microbiome has got a large part of our individualized response to food. And we do want to be able to turn to food instead of medications in the future, if that will make us healthier. The missing link here is that we don't know that these spikes of triglycerides or glucose or whatever is linked to heart disease or cancer or neurologic diseases. That's the missing piece. Right and there. since you're about to team me up for a, a little promotion for my Food and Society program, could you talk about the Geisinger Pharmacy to do with diabetes control? Right. So what I just was reviewing was the high-tech side. The low-tech side, which is another food as medicine story, was initiated by Geisinger, a very progressive health system in Danville, Pennsylvania. And what they did was they recognized that there are a lot of people in their community that had this so-called food insecurity, that weren't getting the right foods, and they and basically... they didn't know where their next meal was coming from from one day to the next. Exactly. And so they, they had food delivered to them, this, uh, this food pharmacy program. And the diabetics in this program had a remarkable improvement of their glucose regulation, and they had a big reduction in their need to have emergency room visits and hospitalization. So it was a great program, and you wonder why we don't do this more. Well, thank you, because in fact, the Food is Medicine initiative of the Food and Society program is looking to extend exactly this kind of advice to underserved areas, to programs that aren't aware of it, and make that reach much more. Because the data you say about emergency department admissions uh, coming down, it's already been shown in a few pioneer studies to significantly reduce healthcare costs. So it's very important that these be extended. But bring us into the future with AI and machine learning. So first tell us some of the factors that made that glucose readout in that list of 150,000 foods that you could go into to predict your glucose reaction <laughs> wasn't entirely useful because they were factors they hadn't bothered to ask. Yeah, so they, they never asked me, did you have other medical conditions that would, could be diet related? And I happened to have had multiple bouts of kidney stones, which was calcium oxalate. I'm not supposed to have high oxalate foods. So the diet recommendation were totally uh, uh, absent, that uh, vital piece. So that just shows you how kind of complex this story is. It needs to be truly bespoke, and it has to take in all of one's uh, concurrent condition. And if you did this again, would you go to Bite Snap, which right. we are now promoting because this is the Big Brother, Big Sister app in which you take photographs of your plate rather than describing and estimating what's on it, and it in, in analyzes, according to you, with uncanny accuracy, what the calorie and, and uh, protein and fat content are. Yeah, so it's a free app. Uh, there are others, but this one is rated the best for accuracy. 
Uh, it's a lot better than what I had to do and all the other people where they had to log write, write in everything that they ate and drank. This is a more automated. I don't think anybody wants to do this long term, but for a week or two to learn about certain foods that could have an adverse, an unwittingly adverse effect, it might be useful. And what's the potential? And then I'm going to ask you to yeah. judge your evaluation of what you think the potential is. So, so vault us into the future. What needs to be done to get to the point where we could all... Um, send in some saliva or something that would enable this kind of individual readout that you think might be taking into account enough factors, enough data, with a database sufficiently robust as a reference to result in something we would actually follow day by day? Well, I think it's coming. Right now, there is absolutely no uh, offering that has any science behind it that's credible. Which is not to say that there's no offering because right. there's oh, no, a lot no. of offerings. Oh, yeah. that, no, that, in my, in my caveat, book. emptor everybody. <laughs> yeah. There, uh, there's all this personalized nutrition, yeah. nutrition, nutrigenomics, vinomics. I mean, all this stuff is complete balderdash. Yeah. Balderdash. That's the word <laughs> of the day, Christy. It is. But it's also, I think, the concern here, like, look. The low-hanging fruit here is not the personalized spike that this particular food, it's the stuff of like basic nutritional, I mean the study you were talking about with Geisner, they're talking about ha helping people have access to healthy foods. It wasn't that they were having one particular food, it was that these were people that had food insecurity to begin with, that they were being given access to healthy foods, they were being given help um, in managing their diabetes and things like this. And so I think we're so quick to look for that magic solution or the idea that, you know, for me, I'm so different, and so if I just eat this one food instead of the other, everything will be perfect. And there probably are cases of that, but it's far less important than the big picture and the overall. Well, I, I, I appreciate the basics, your right? skepticism, yeah. but um, the point here is that if you have glucose spikes, you know, about a billion people on the planet are at risk for developing type 2 diabetes. And if you're having spikes of 180 and 200 and you don't know it, and you can avoid that, that might be a good thing. So we shouldn't just turn our backs on this. It's, it's, it could be useful information. We want to prevent people from developing diabetes. And, uh, you know, it's just, th this is the sort of information with a low-cost glucose sensor, a short-term thing for a week or two, that could be someday, you know, really inexpensive and useful. But I just have to be the skeptic here, <laughs> and it's like, so you do this for one week, we know that there are a lot of other things that can influence these things, your sleep status, stress, yeah. other nutritional things. And so is this reproducible? You know, so you eat this food that this week is giving you this big spike. Will that also be true under different circumstances? And also you said in your piece, what if I have a Cherokee tomato for lunch with balsamic vinegar right. because it's tomato season, but it's then tomato season. for nine months of the year, I'm not going to eat a tomato. Right. I don't know that these apps are designed for seasonal followers and farmer's market adherents like you. Right, and so the other danger here, so this 538 piece that I did, I enlisted some colleagues and we actually did this fun project. So one of the, the concerns here is when you get a very large data set, it's easy to find spurious results. And this is a whole other issue we don't have time for, but there's a thing called piacking. So basically, using statistical analyses with very large samples, you can find associations that are probably always worth looking into, but really need to be confirmed. And so in our project, we sort of played around with this using um, actual data. We took these food frequency questionnaires, we enlisted some readers to help us, and we were able to uh, associate math aptitude with potato chip consumption. So if you want to be good at math, you know, eat lots of chips. Um, <laughs> oh, one of my favorites was that um, people who uh, cut the fat off their steaks were more likely to be atheists than people who ate the, the but that seems fat that God had given them on that stage. That seems intuitive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you would be surprised. Could you take us through just, since p-hacking is a really important concept when reading any nutrition study, yeah. but really any meta survey in general, could you just uh, tell us what p-hacking sure. is? Sure, so p-hacking, and the very best thing you can do, I, I wrote a story for 538 called Science Isn't Broken, and with this, I worked with a, one of my data viz colleagues, and we actually built a tool. The best data way- Data visualization. Yeah, the best way to understand p-hacking is to try it, and if you go to Science Isn't Broken, 
in at 538, um, you'll find this and you can actually play around with it. So what we did is we basically gave readers a chance to see what this, what this is like. And so we used real data and we presented a research pro problem. So the research question was this. You are a social scientist and your hypothesis is that the political party that's in charge can influence the economy and that has a direct effect on the economy. Okay, great. So how are you gonna test this? Immediately you run into this problem. How are we going to measure this? But we used real data, we presented real data and so readers could choose the data sets and choose, so it's things like, are you going to look at Congress? Are you looking at who's president? Are you looking at governors and, and state houses? Things like this. And so, but basically by fiddling around with these decisions, you could create data, you could create a p-value, and a p-value is a statistical, it's, it's a statistic that's used very often and erroneously as sort of a threshold test of whether it's- It's the threshold test, so people just, say it's past the p-threshold. Yeah. Or they will say statistically <laughs> significant is often the terminology, and these are useful tests that have a place in science, I believe, but they are too often misused as sort of a, a barometer of like, is it true or isn't it? And what we, we showed with this tool that we made is that you could play around with the data to support any hypothesis. You could support using actual data and real science that Democrats are better for the, the economy or that they're worse for the economy or Republicans are better for the economy or they're worse for the economy. But I think the, the takeaway here is that, you know, it's that whole lies, damn lies and statistics. And the takeaway is not that science is unreliable. It's read lies, damn lies and statistics. <laughs> it is a short and great book about, uh, and also how to lie with statistics. Yeah. These are great books. Yeah. Can I go back to Eric? Thank yes. you for that skepticism. <laughs> um, you mentioned the micro... I'm nothing if not skeptical. That's well, a you're a journalist. Name <laughs> you're a journalist. That's what we are. So Trust but verify. The microbiome, um, that's so important in understanding individualized reaction. Um, but for a long time, it was the genome yeah. and being able to go and find what was in your genome. Can you lead us through this progression from genome to microbiome? Right, so you know, back in 2000 when uh, at the White House lawn when they announced the, the secret of life code was broken and uh, you know, this was Clinton and Venner and Francis Collins all together, it obviously was uh, misguided because you know, here we are 19 years later and we haven't exactly demystified all of life. We made some progress. But the difference was the expectations from our genome, which obviously is very important, uh, were, were exceptionally high. And we didn't understand how important the, the gut microbiome in particular is. And now, every week, we're seeing things, not only the fact that almost every drug we take has a specific interaction with our gut microbiome, so you may be taking a drug and it doesn't work because of a bacterium that you have, or a not, you may have the bacterium, but you have a different sequence in it. Um, and you can only find that through a, 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 an assay called what we call metagenomics. But, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a striking uh, study showed that there was a bacterium in the gut microbiome that was discovered that makes an enzyme that changes the blood types from A or B or AB to blood type O. So now that can be used to convert everybody's blood to a universal donor, which is changing the entire landscape of blood transfusion. So, so we expect to see a revival of Theranos any day. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think the, the key takeaway here is that it's very different. The, the genome, we had unrealistic expectations and the, the microbiome is just the opposite. We're, we're finding all these things that are, you know, I mentioned the athlete thing today, who would have ever guessed? And who knows what we're gonna find next week? So it's, it's wild. And did either of you have, um, go ahead, Christine. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's really exciting, but I think it's really important to understand, and I agree with most of what Eric just said. This is really exciting stuff, I think. Um, but we are at a part in the process. I think it's important, and I don't think that the, public always has a good understanding of how science works and how it progresses. And so science is actually a process of uncertainty reduction. And I think too often the public has sort of been given this view that science is a magic wand that turns everything it touches into truth. But it turns out that science is very often wrong on the way to being right. And I think it's important that we understand this because if you don't understand that it's a process of uncertainty reduction and that each study can maybe if you're very lucky, provide answer an answer to one very, very specific question, and yet it will always 
throw up 10 other questions, then each time you see this new study that overturns something else, it's easy to think, oh, well, what does science know? Every day now we have a different finding or things get overturned. I mean, this is the classic, like, is coffee good for you or bad for you today? I wrote a book on coffee and had to go through 300 studies of caffeine, which are incredibly, <laughs> no, it was actually 312, because I'll never forget it. Um, or do it again, I hope. And uh, they were so conflicting, but in general, I, I found a consensus. And I, I happened to teach at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and policy, and this bedevils anyone trying to understand nutrition. The idea, as you just beautifully said, that science is progressive, it zigs and it zags, and it arrives at an answer, but the problem with the media, yeah, dare I say, is... Yeah, I do think that we are partially responsible, and this is something I've thought a lot about, and I've done a lot of work and a lot of speaking about, just how the, the media portrays science in public. And I think it's important that we are very clear about the caveats of every study. I mean, the microbiome stuff is so exciting, and we know that it's very important. But I think it's important as the media, but also as the public, to understand that these are early days. And so right now, we know that the microbiome is very important. We know we have tantalizing evidence that it can make a difference and that there are probably things that we can learn that will help us be healthier. But we're not there yet. And we need to be really careful. And one thing that we've seen again and again, and this is something I document in my book, is times when we had one small little study that had some really enticing and interesting finding. Everyone jumps on the bandwagon. All of a sudden, everyone's doing this thing or taking this drug or, or this food or whatever it is, adopting this practice. And then you know more studies come out and we do some more research. And it turns out we had things completely wrong, not for because the first study was bad, but because we were looking at the wrong thing. And for thing, example, Eric, you're a complete fan of the keto diet, are you not? No. <laughs> Gosh, no. <laughs> No, but you know, there, the people are religious about this. There's probably some, you know, keto diet uh, aficionados here, and if you don't have to raise it, your hands, <laughs> if you if you question it, oh my gosh, you know, it's it's like uh, religion or politics. So the problem is, some people keto diet is pretty good, and I, I go back to another point: uh, coffee and everything that we take in. There are studies that show it's either good or bad. You know, in in the deep diet chapter in Deep Medicine, I show the, the remarkable uh, graphic about all these studies, hundreds of studies, where it makes, you know, it'll kill you or it'll make you healthier. Yes. Now, the point is that there may be some truth to that. It may not be such a wrong signal because we are so individualized in our response. And so for some people, a keto diet may be really good for them. Uh, some people may be a paleo diet. Some people may be the grapefruit diet. Who knows? But that's what I'm, uh, the excitement I have. And I agree about the, the science and the need for replication and the need for uncertainty, and always assume it's wrong until it's replicated you know, umpteen times. But um, we're making some headway here. And no one had expected the gut microbiome was going to be such a big driver in our nutritional response. No one had expected that identical twins would have such a remarkable difference in their food intake response. So we're learning things. And these things have been replicated. They're not one-off reports. Yeah, and I think the distinction here is to think about, so this is really exciting science, and Eric's a scientist and working in this field, and it's the difference between being excited about the science and studying it more and saying, this is a really cool study, and now we replicated it, but now we need to do even more studies to see how generalizable it is. And so we did it, and we're seeing this really exciting finding in mice, but does it translate to humans? Okay, we're, we're seeing it under this context and another, and I think the danger here is when we all sort of get on the bandwagon. There's all this, there's very good evidence to show that medical reversals are really hard. So like basically one, once something comes into widespread practice, it's very difficult to change that practice. So I think we need to be really careful about adopting things um, until we, we've really done enough confirmation that it's something worthwhile because we can really go down the wrong track. And some of you might have been in this very room at the beginning of Aspen Ideas Health, which preceded uh, the first part of the Aspen Ideas Festival, in which there's a presentation of the new Welcome Monitor Science Trust Report, in which the trust of science, and particularly vaccines, was enormously variable by country, much more than, than any scientist would wish. Uh, and so we see that variance uh, playing out across the world. Um, one of the studies, and I'm about to throw it open to questions, so please think of questions when we've got mic runners, uh, that just was reported on was done by the National Institutes of Health, terrifically expensive study for only four weeks. Why is it terrifically expensive? 
because it had 39 subjects who were otherwise completely healthy and in their 30s, no dietary risk, no nothing. They were sort of tabula rasas. And they were given for two weeks uh, a diet with a certain amount of protein, saturated fat, fat, sugar, uh, calories, and fiber every day. And they were told, here's your set of snacks, and you can eat just as much as you want between meals. And we're going to give you the main meals. Uh, they looked very similar in photographs if you shoot them prettily. But one was made from highly processed and ultra-processed foods. What does ultra-processed mean? It's a technical term meaning one food that's made from several kinds of processed foods, so it becomes ultra-processed, whereas the other was largely from whole foods cooked uh, in the workshop at NIH. And everything about these people was uh, measured, just the way Eric was saying early, their stool, their blood, their exercise levels, everything about what they were ex uh, exhuming at, at night, their, their transpiration rate. And after two weeks, and then they were switched to the other one to be controlled, so four weeks, two weeks uh, on uh, each diet. And they found that uh, after two weeks, the ones on the um, processed food diet ate a five to 600 more calories a day and gained two pounds. The ones on the whole food diet lost two pounds in the same amount. Every explanation of this so far is a theory. Is it because the fiber on the ultra-processed food was given in liquid, it was stirred into your juice, your diet lemonade, which is exactly what they did, or was it because it's your individualized microbiome? So this is the kind of thing, looks provocative, but there's no actual conclusion that we can draw it. Absolutely, and I think it is a fascinating study. One thing I was struck by was how come it took so long to do this study. Right, you know, yeah. it's like money. Wow. It's so expensive. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. hard too because I mean, this goes back to my notion that so many nutrition studies are of very low quality. It's very difficult. The only way you can truly know what people are eating is to feed it to them yourself. It's to lock them up. The, yeah, you, you have get, to lock have them to lock up. Them. Provide all the meals. You're weighing it. I mean, even like I mean. This, this Snapchat, whatever, the Bite Chat. Bite Snap. Bite Snap. Boy, yeah, they're going to so get a really, lot of downloads. Really interesting. But, you know, how can the picture know whether there's two tablespoons or one tablespoon of butter in that thing? Or, like, I mean, I, I think that there's just, there's an, there are inherent limits in being able to measure what people are actually. And by the same token, how do we know when we we're don't. asked to report yeah. it on, I mean, on these surveys? Yeah, well, out sample it, size, or, the machines uh, work better than humans certain, in this case. They do. I believe All that. All right, yeah. thanks, Eric. Um, <laughs> Could we have questions? Do we have any questions in the audience? We've got a gentleman in the back. We can hear you and we'll repeat it if you can't. Oh, I've heard the, about the Hippocrates Institute. That's all I've heard. Which sounds intriguing, by the way. It's all green. No meat, no fish, no chicken. And it's amazing what you energy that will get. My question, specific question, everybody's saying too, um, diet. There's certain foods that are really not good. And there, there you go. That was a um, cheerful note to open the mic. Can you? Can you identify if it is, what test is there for an individual, each, each of us sitting here, is it a blood test, a, 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 a saliva test that will actually say, in your case, you shouldn't eat this, but in your case over here, you should? No, I actually think we don't have that. It's in a research mode right now. Uh, I understand Christy is skeptical it'll ever be a, a worthwhile, but I actually do think it will be. But right now, we don't have uh, a way to do that there are people marketing through your companies, but they haven't done it right. That is, you have to have all this data. And in fact, it's not even just sleep. It's not just how many hours. It's the actual level of light and REM and different types of sleep. It's not, we don't want to oversimplify any of these components. But yes, all these things interact. They have to be collected for the individual. And it's part of our uniqueness. So anybody who claims that this diet is right for you know, all people is just off base because we have too much evidence against that. That's all research. There is no commercial entity today that I'm aware of that is bringing this to the public. And well, don't you believe it if you see someone who tells you that there is. <laughs> um, gentlemen, right there. What is the 
Nope, sorry. Nope, he's got the mic, and then we'll come to you. Sorry. Uh, I, got, I got the mic now. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, excuse my throaty voice. Uh, Whole Foods has a terrific new product where you can buy butter lettuce washed, ready to put into the salad bowl, and it's encased in a pretty heavy plastic top. What do you have to say to that? Um, now tell us what the product encased in the heavy plastic we're all hissing at just at the idea of. What is the product itself? Lettuce. The product is, uh, is butter lettuce. And it's beautiful. And I love it. But then, <laughs> and then I throw that plastic tub away and I say, oh boy, <laughs> who's going to get after me? Well, I'll just say that lettuce is an incredibly easy crop to grow. And I, I would love to see more of a movement towards home. I mean, I understand. I did a huge piece on vertical farming. And whenever you're getting something that's been grown indoors by specific light, it's generally lettuce. It doesn't say on the label, but I would wager that that probably was grown indoors. And, and uh, it's perfectly good for you. It's, it's hydroponic or it's aeroponic. Um, but that's what you often find in uh, Whole Foods and stores. But the fact is, it seems to be healthful and you eat it. It appeals to you and you actually eat it. And that's the huge yeah. barrier in all of these dietary recommendations, getting people to adhere to it. It doesn't matter. You like it and you're eating it. So I think any nutritionist would say, keep eating it. Right, right. Uh, two gentlemen, let's have two questions since they're right next to each what other. Are uh, you are the next, and then behind you. Uh, what are the three biggest current fads in diet today that are probably not necessarily true? Good. We've got one question, and we're going to immediately follow it with the gentleman all behind. All of them, yeah. I mean, no, I no, Christy, wait. Before the answer. Oh, got it. Uh, um, I guess two, two, two parts of the question. One is can you explain as a layman why glucose spikes and insulin resistance are so important for longevity. And two, um, I loved your op-ed about the AI diet. Uh, there, Thank you. Uh, there are, I think, a few things that are near commercialization that you've alluded to. How many years until you, you, you think there's a solution that's worthwhile to try out? Right. Let's start with three dumb fads. <laughs> All of them. I mean, by definition, a fad is sort of dumb, right? but keep going with ones that you particularly dislike. We've had Eric on keto. We're going to ask you for more. Um, Christy, can you think of three dumb things? Uh, the paleo diet. I wrote something for the Washington Post about this. Um, you know, the, the fact, the idea even that it's based on what our paleo ancestors is ridiculous. Yeah, like all that nice wheat and lovely yeah, right, stuff. Right. So the the <laughs> one fat, the diet that really got us in trouble was the low fat. Yeah, diet. yeah, low fat. It just promoted obesity and it, yeah. it was a disaster and it was the diet for, you know, decades. Yeah. There's lots of chapter and verse on that. Uh, the history of uh, demonizing fat as opposed to sugar and how that's already changed. Now, diets, uh, products that are coming along that are a few years ahead, time Well, prediction. yeah, I, you know, this is a really good point. So there have been companies, like the one that I mentioned in the uh, New York Times essay called Day Two, they just are taking shortcuts, so I can't recommend it. That is, they only do the gut microbiome, and then they give you a output of recommended food. That's not, that doesn't cut it to me, and I wouldn't pay a, a dime for that, because it isn't getting you through all this multimodal data together. But the other point you asked, which I think is fundamental, what about these glucose spikes? that after you eat and it gets to 180 or you know, 200 that you didn't know about. And remind us of that leading to insulin resistance. The yeah, and, and the insulin resistance, which it turns out, uh, people that might have very high insulin levels and they aren't responding uh, to insulin, these are things that we do know are precursors to diabetics, to diabetes. The problem, what we don't know, is pinpointing it on that person. See, if you have a glucose spikes, multiple spikes, you know, high, are you going to de develop diabetes? We know it's a general risk factor. We also know that if you have high glucoses on a frequent basis, it gives a permeability of your gut mucosa, so you're much more likely to have inflammation in your body, and whether that can lead to many different diseases. But what we need to do is invest in a long-term trial where we look at these spikes and do a randomized trial and see what happens about heart disease and cancer and neurodegenerative diseases and autoimmune diseases, and then we'll get the final thing. But right now, glucose spikes and triglyceride spikes are not enough. What I tried to do is convey that we're chipping away at this. We're not there. And nobody should, I don't believe, sign up for any 
uh, kind of commercial tech. And as soon as you say what we need is a long-term, <laughs> longitudinal yeah. Yeah. study, yeah. you know, everybody you pictures think? enormous dollar signs, who's going to sponsor this, who's going to do the kind of basic science that it was amazing the NIH did, yeah. in this case, yeah. control uh, process versus uh, ultra-processed, uh, non-processed food. The, the lady in the back and then the gentleman right here, and could we have Mike Runners uh, cue them both up? Hi, thank you for all of your information. I, I'd like to know your opinions of the nutrition bars that are everywhere, and also supplements and vitamins. Oh, good. Everybody's favorite subject, nutritional supplements, and yeah. are they worth the money? Are they? Uh, <laughs> I have a piece coming out on the Annals of Internal Medicine next week, and I mean, no, supplements, uh-uh, no, there's I, no data for those. I have an entire chapter in my book. Uh, I'll just give it away. The title of the chapter is a Selling Snake Oil, so that sort of tells you. Um, an important thing to know about nutritional supplements is not just that no one actually needs them, but also that there's very little oversight. And, Regulation. Yeah. There is no there is They're no exempted. Oversight. Yeah, yeah, from the kind of regulation we expect they're subject to, and the so, nutritional supplement industry has done a very good job of getting them classified as something that just escapes. So they're completely untrustworthy, and so are their claims. Could we have two questions? There's, there's a gentleman right here, and then two, two rows behind yeah. him. What are your thoughts on fasting and micro-fasting, maybe 12 to 16 hours? Oh, I'm so glad you asked about intermittent fasting. So that, there's a, a lot, of, that's a fad right now. But what's really interesting about this is the circadian clock. And so, you know, we, we all have our own biorhythm circadian clock. And it may be Sachin Panda, who's a colleague of mine at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, where I work, uh, has written a book, The Circadian Code, which is quite good. And he's, a, he's done a lot of good science, as others have done in this area. And the question is, should you, the, there's a question about fasting, but it's also about should you have whatever you're going to eat, should you have it in a short time of the day, within 10 hours, let's say, because it's this eating, and it's been shown in certain studies, eating uh, throughout the day in the evening is, pr makes you prone to obesity and gaining weight. So we have a lot to learn, but there's a lot of really interesting data coming out. A lot to learn. Gentlemen in the back, and then the two people right here on this row, Unless he's thought better of it. It was the same question about intermittent fasting. So okay, great. We've go. got two people right here on the ends in the front row. Let's start with the lady. Hi. Um, so I'm the mom of small children. I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old little girls. And I view them kind of as a blank slate. And there's so much information about nutrition, obviously, for all of us. And I feel like at my age, it's more about <laughs> fixing, <laughs> you know, bad habits. But with them, it's a blank slate. And it is so overwhelming as a mother to figure out how to navigate, you know, giving them great nutrition, obviously good proteins, good fats, good vegetables. Where I struggle, and I've actually kind of come to conflict with, is at school when they're giving them all these sugary treats. So they're giving them donuts, and they're giving them this. And so obviously, that's terrible for children and you'd be proud, I took it to the administration. But there's also then the social ramifications of having your child be ostracized or not participating and then you get into the whole eating disorder area. So as a parent trying to navigate this, do you have any suggested resources or some basic information um, or suggestions? Because I'm frankly just overwhelmed. Start with you, Christy, that her. Yeah. This is interesting. I was on a panel a few years ago here at Aspen Ideas um, where we talked about there are some really interesting programs going on in schools where they're trying to bring better nutrition to schools. Um, but I guess I would come around to, I think that there's um, a common theme here where we know that nutrition is really important. I mean, it just has to be, right? It's what we're putting into our bodies. It's the fuels that we're running on. But it's also something that we can control. And so we all, you know, all sorts of weird and bad things happen to our bodies. And I think that we sometimes sort of ascribe a, an oversized sense of control to the things that we're eating. And by that, I mean, like, the idea that, like, this one snack on a particular day is going to have this, like, enormous... Destructive effect. domino effect. Right. And so, but, but I, I think the point here is that it... Be, 
our stress and our sort of need to control this can become a source of stress and a source of like its own problem. And I think that's a real danger, particularly with kids. Like you don't want to be demonizing foods or making them obsessed about foods in that sort of way. And so I'm not a parent, so I can't really speak to like how I would deal with that. But I know like particularly with athletes, which is what I'm familiar with and what my book's about, um, you know, if you're getting into situations where what you feel like is acceptable food or good food is so narrow that it's not accessible to you a lot of the time, then all of a sudden you, you're sort of making yourself unhealthier because you're introducing this major source of stress. Stress, sleep. Eric. No, I don't have anything to add. I think that's good. Good. <laughs> Great. Sleep. Last question, gentlemen. All right, save the best for last. Uh, <laughs> thanks for your time. I'm a fitness entrepreneur from Boston. Uh, developing a platform to empower uh, fitness uh, influencers. And my question is, because uh, I work with uh, you know, various clients throughout the, throughout the year, and uh, the main goal that I generally uh, attract is clients that are trying to lose weight uh, slash fat, and they're scared to eat carbs. What do you say about that? Both of you, carbs, sugars, getting back to insulin resistance. Eric. Yeah, and no, I think this is an individualized response. I and mean, I think that the data to support that tenant is overwhelming now, but we just, we're talking about big data per individual and by many different layers of data. And it, that's what's, one of the most exciting things about AI practically is to be able to uh, actualize this food as medicine principle but we're in the early stages of that. So I, I, I don't think there's an answer for more, for more than you know, the individual person. And Chris, I was deliberately setting up what I said. You, don't you mean protein only, not carbs? Because in fact, you think it's an overall picture. Yeah, it's an overall picture. And I, I challenged someone to run a marathon without any carbs. Like, you just, you can't do it. And in fact, I was saying in my earlier session about this, um, I just was at the American College of Sports Medicine meeting a few weeks ago, and there was a great presentation there by a nutritionist, Louise Burke, who's one of the top in the field. And she actually did a study on race walkers with keto diet. And this was something where they, they were like at the Olympic training, they were in a situation where they were actually feeding them the diet so they could be sure they were adhering. And the first takeaway was that the athletes hated it it was really hard to do, but also their performance plummeted. They had a really hard time because it was such low carbohydrate. And when you are doing endurance exercise, that's what your body is running on is carbohydrates. The thing that was really interesting is when the athletes went off the diet, then all of a sudden their performance got a hell of a lot better. They were sell setting PRs and things like that. And one of the, the proposed explanations for this was that the being on this uh, diet, which they hated so much, sort of increased their capacity for suffering. So it's kind of an <laughs> intriguing idea. I don't know. You know, again, it needs to be replicated. It's, it's hard to know exactly what to make out of that. Great. So that's we're way out of time, but way great panel. So the lessons are trust in science, be patient, read Christy and Eric, and sleep. Thank you all. <laughs>